the problem is not uh, uh, organized crime, it's the way we perceive organized crime. Imagine a government, imagine uh, constituents uh, in an area, they don't see violence, they don't perceive organized crime. They perceive organized crime only when you associate a criminal organization to violence. When they see blood on the street, that's when they complain. Otherwise, the major issue is traffic. Hey, my name is Ben Charland, and you're listening to another episode of What on Earth is Going On, this week with the Mafia. My guest is Antonio Nicazzo, a best-selling author of over 30 books, award-winning journalist, researcher, and lecturer, and all on one subject, the Mafia, organized crime. It's a really fascinating conversation, not just about the symbols and the rituals and the myth of the Mafia, but how those things enable and justify the Mafia to get away with what it does, which is crime, criminal behavior, and of course, building networks of trust between it and the government, institutions, to legitimize the work that it does, and also simply to get away with it. I'm really excited to show you this conversation, and I can't wait for you to tell me what you think of it. Give me your feedback about the show. Go to the website, wogopodcast.com. That's W-O-E-G-O podcast.com. Go there, give your review, give your rating on iTunes or Facebook or whatever podcast app that you use. And please get in touch. Wogopodcast at gmail.com is my email. Send me a note. Let me know what you think. All right, Professor Nikazo, welcome to the program. My pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, you are an expert in organized crime in the mafia, and you're actually currently the executive producer of a show on Netflix called Bad Blood, um, which was originally a Canadian show uh, because it's based on a book that you wrote back in 2015. Um, but there's a lot that you talk about when it comes to the mafia, and I think one of the great things that you've done through over 30 books that you've written is to demystify the mafia and get behind the myth and the ritual and the symbolism that the mafia is and actually get to what it actually does, which is organized crime and violence and, and coercion. Um, so I'm really interested to talk about that. But before we do, you've got the first question, as always, and that is, Professor Nicazzo, what on earth is going on? But uh, I would like to uh, stay on my issue mm -hmm. and uh, express... Uh, uh, concern uh, uh, about uh, the um, evolution of organized crime. Um, mobsters are using uh, bitcoins uh, to purchase narcotics. They mm. using um, uh, the internet or the dark net uh, right. to ship narcotics, uh, to contact the clients, to be contacted, and to use uh, any kind of a language without uh, the fear to be intercepted. And uh, and I think. Uh, uh, we see an increase of uh, cooperation um, among uh, major criminal organizations. We don't see uh, the same uh, strategy from uh, government uh, uh, levels. Uh, uh, we don't see an increase of cooperation in uh, the fight uh, against organized crime. One thing that I read that you wrote was that uh, back in about 10, 15 years ago was that when the war on terror took place, um, it essentially moved aside the war on organized crime. It became much more of a, a present story that we need to tackle. And one thing that organized crime does through the mafia is it creates a sense amongst people that, oh, these are good, honorable guys, perhaps defending traditional family values, and they might do it in a violent way, but at heart, they're okay people. And, uh, you know, I guess there's nothing necessarily wrong with that statement, but it hides the criminal activity that's beneath that. Um, so what, um, I mean, do you think that we're still living in an era now where organized crime and the mafia kind of takes a back seat to other policy priorities? But we have to be clear what, uh, what uh, organized crime is all about. Um, Sometimes we focus on the violent aspect of organized crime. Mm -hmm. Uh, but organized crime is something more than that, especially if you consider the uh, historical longevity of the Mafia, the Ndrangheta, the, the Yakuza, the Triads. Uh, if you want to understand um, the nature of those criminal organizations, you have to uh, 
uh, forget uh, any mythology. Uh, mm. uh, that provides a self-service for themselves to portray them as a man of honor, in some way attached uh, to the culture and the history of a country. Uh, the mafia and other mafia type criminal organization are product of the ruling classes of some country. Mm. Um, and if we want to understand uh, the, the, the nature of organized crime in Canada and in the United States, so we have to uh, imagine uh, elected officials who uh, routinely franchise the vice and crime in exchange for money and votes. Right. The idea of the political machine, mm -hmm. Tammany Hall, the padrone system in, in Canada, criminals capable to provide cheap labors, to provide the, uh, political support in exchange of license, license to run a tavern, mm -hmm. license to run a, a place where they benefit from uh, uh, prostitution, gambling, right. and many other things. So, when I um, when I uh, teach social history of organized crime, in my class uh, I use. Uh, a chemical uh, formula for water to describe the complexity of organized crime. The two atoms of hydrogen represent the violence. And the violence is a resource, but it's common to many criminal organizations. What mm. makes the difference is the atom of oxygen, because that is the relation uh, to the power. Mm. Uh, we use uh, this word, the underworld, uh, to describe organized crime. Imagine the upper world. And organized crime, the mafia, is a combination of uh, underworld and upper world. You mm. can call the upper crust, you can call the whatever you like, but if uh, you uh, have uh, in front of you um, the charts of a criminal organization, you see that there is a boss, the underboss, uh, uh, people in charge of several crew, crews, uh, and then the foot soldiers. But there are other important people associates right and they don't have uh, to be affiliated uh, uh, inducted into the organization they can yeah. provide services they can be lawyers chartered accountant politician any kind of people and they may not even be aware that they're actually assisting organized crime i think one of the things that you've written is that there are bureaucrats and accountants and lawyers who are are tertiary to the to the issue but by doing their work they enable organized crime because it's such a vast network um, in the first episode of Bad Blood, uh, a really excellent show, um, which is, uh, like I said earlier, based on your book, one thing that I noticed, which was clearly a, a reference to your work, was that the, the mob boss in it, Vito Risotto, who's a real person, um, essentially says to all of the people, all of the organized crime syndicate that he's working with in Montreal, look, this is what I can provide for you. I will give you the access to the city hall, to the police, to the, to the organization, to the legitimate side of the world, to the, to the upper world, as you call it, right? And what that references in your work is you often talk about how what organized crime or the mafia provides is not violence. They provide uh, human capital or social capital, access to not only those, these organizations, but a promise of trust, a network of trust. Essentially, there's a scene in, in that first episode where Vito Risotto meets with, I think he's the chief of police or someone in the, in the police organization, and he essentially, they make a deal, essentially, where he says, okay, you keep the bloodshed down, and I'll let you do your organized crime. I'll let you continue with your activities. And there's a deal bes between the upper world and the underworld there, but it's based on trust because both sides think that the other one will live up to the deal. And to us on the outside, we think of that as a moral or an honorable situation, maybe a code of honor, which again hides the real behavior that's happening underneath. Um, but when, it, when we talk about these systems of trust, is this, is this the same thing true in Italy, in Calabria, in Sicily, in New York, in Montreal? Is this a, a pretty clear moniker of what organized crime and the mafia is? Ben, you caught the essence of organized crime. Organized crime uh, is, uh, uh, is based on a network of trust. You need to build uh, trust uh, with the people outside of the organization. 
the mafia is not a way of thinking, but it's a way of doing. And you can reproduce that mechanism, that model everywhere. Mm. You need connection, you need collusion, you need to build uh, a, a network, a system that works in Canada or in the United States or in Italy. You mentioned uh, Vito Rizzuto. Vito Rizzuto uh, made the two big things in the underworld. The first one was to cut the link with the Bonannos because uh, he wants to manage uh, his own business uh, and be independent from the United States. And the Bonannos are one of the original five families of New York. Correct, one of the five families of the New York. And uh, Canada was an appendix. They have uh, a branch, uh, like a, um, imagine a big bank and a branch of that right. bank in Canada. And, uh, and the second um, important thing was to uh, create a consortium, uh, a strategic alliances between uh, the mafia, the Hells Angels, street gangs, Colombian cartels, mm. Irish mafia, and, and they make them uh, to be part of a project. He liked to call himself the CEO of that uh, kind of uh, uh, consortium. And, uh, and, and they share profit and, and, and reduce violence. Uh, and, and for so many years, uh, there was uh, very little violence because uh, every criminal organization had a task, a role. The mafia was involved on the level of uh, importation. The health angels uh, with the chapters all over the place uh, were in charge of distribution. Street gangs uh, uh, dealt with uh, the selling on the street. The Irish uh, uh, controlled the docks. Mm -hmm. uh, the Colombians uh, made the deal uh, provide the cocaine. A and, and everyone uh, took a, a piece of mm -hmm. the pie. And it was stable, uh, I was think stable. is the key word. Yeah. It was stable. Um, because, as you know, the the the, the the problem is not uh, uh, organized crime, it's the way we perceive organized crime. Imagine a government, imagine a constituents uh, in an area. They don't see violence, they don't perceive organized crime. They perceive organized crime only when you associate a criminal organization to violence. Mm -hmm. When they see blood on the street, that's when they complain. Otherwise, the major issue is traffic. Right. or many other issues, but not necessarily organized crime. So keep the, the violence low means that you can enjoy the, the benefits of a great country like Canada. And stay low on the radar too. I mean, one thing that you've noted, I think in a Globe and Mail article, was that the Cosa Nostra, the five families of New York, have a very high profile from the godfather of 1972, uh, the film, obviously, by uh, Francis Ford Coppola, and many, many, many gangster films after that focus on the Sicilian mafia in New York, but the uh, Ndrangheta, if I'm saying that right, uh, which um, has a very strong presence now in Toronto, actually, uh, which, and we forget about that. We don't think that there's an, a, a Toronto mafia, but there very much is. And, of course, going back to Italy, one thing that uh, w blew my mind, and I'm not sure if this is true, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but in 2010... Uh, it was believed that the, the collected mafia in the south of Italy comprised 3.5% of the country's GDP. When I read, that, and that's, that's per year, it's about 40, million, 40 billion euros of income per year, not just wealth, but income. When I read something like that, it seems to me like there would have to be an uncanny amount of cooperation amongst all levels of Italian society. And I read about one town, San Luca in Italy, in Calabria, which essentially every single male living in San Luca is a member of Indrangheta, uh, is a member of the mafia in that town. Again, I don't know if these are exaggerations, but it seems to me that the point would be true no matter what, which is that the cooperation required on all levels would be immense. And it seems to me that that cooperation is not only stable, but legitimate, at least in the eyes of trust and when you and I make a deal, we stay true to it. And so there's, there, there is a sense of honor among thieves in, in the old saying. Um, is this true? Do you think that, that are we on to something or is this a bit exaggeration and, uh, and hyperbole here? You mentioned Calabria. Calabria is one of the poorest regions of Europe. Uh, but it's also home 
of uh, the most powerful criminal organization, an organization that uh, was for so many years underestimated, considered and regarded as a second class uh, criminal organization compared to the Sicilian Mafia. Uh, probably because the Sicilian Mafia entered uh, into the uh, collective imagination, the shared imagination of people, uh, thanks to movies uh, like The Godfather. Um, but uh, when you are capable to generate that amount of money, uh, you need to uh, identify places where to invest those money. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you go in Calabria, you don't see anything that looks like uh, a place uh, that benefits from uh, that kind of investment. Right. But if you go in any other uh, country in, in Europe, like Germany, uh, in Canada, uh, Australia, um, you, you can see the, the type of investment because they're looking for places uh, like Canada where uh, they can purchase uh, property through shell companies mm -hmm. and those shell companies registered outside of Canada, they don't have uh, to share with the authority the beneficial owner of the investment. Well, and this is one thing you've talked about. Uh, again, this was in a recent Globe and Mail article in December. You said the reason Canada is so attractive a place to the mafia around the world is because they don't have to disclose the owner of private property. Um, there was actually a quote that I read through your work. I, I can't find the name of it in front of me, but he essentially, he's a, a, a mobster who essentially said that Canada is the perfect place for uh, organized crime except for the weather. That's yes. the one thing. Exactly. That was uh, uh, Alfonso Caruana. Yes who was convicted for uh, uh, drug trafficking um, and, and he loved Canada and only complaint was the weather. Uh, he used to live in Venezuela, in uh, South America. And Canada is a perfect place because uh, uh, you can invest money, you, could, you can do so many things. Uh, uh, we are the only country that uh, do not require two lawyers to do any kind of disclosure. Like a lawyer can uh, uh, really use the um, um, solicitor client privilege and, uh, and avoid any kind of uh, issues with the fin track with the government. Uh, you cannot put any um, bags in, 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 in their place. Uh, so there are so many good lawyers and, and honest lawyers, but they are lawyers that are very functional mm -hmm. to money laundering and to kind of investment. I spoke with people in the underworld and they told me that uh, there are lawyers, uh, are people, uh, uh, professionals that are taking 20-25% wow. on money uh, laundered in our, in our country. It sounds like we're functioning as a sort of what Switzerland does for banking Canada is doing for, I guess, other other elements, whether it's private property or investment. Real estate, it's uh, one of uh, of uh, of the sector uh, right. th that so they like to, uh, uh, where they like to invest more uh, money. And why, I, I understand why they would want to invest in Canada, but why haven't Canadian authorities, whether it's the provinces or the federal government, changed? I mean, is it just simple inertia? Is it lack of care? I mean, because of the articles that you have written, for example, and other people have written, we seem to know that this is a problem, and yet nothing is being done about it. Why, why is that the case? Probably because uh, uh, money does... money does not stink like uh, uh, is an old uh, uh, saying in 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 mm -hmm. the ancient rome and uh, there are lots of money available there especially moment of crisis and uh, many people mm -hmm. like to get that money uh, i remember a conversation intercepted by the FBI in the United States, uh, uh, two uh, bankers were talking and, and they were saying, if we won't take that money, other banks will do. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and today, uh, really, it's a, it's a question of uh, cost and benefit. Uh, if you see what happened to a bank when they uh, laundry money and they, um, uh, they're discovered by the authority, they pay a fine. 
nothing and 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 mm -hmm. i remember a case in in in, in canada a bank uh, that uh, um, fell to report the thousands of uh, suspicious transactions uh, they receive a fine of one million and one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars was that manulife is that the one that i, read I don't about? think it was manulife but it was uh, uh, i don't remember the name of uh, of the bank but it was in the last article that i published on globe and mail but but just to give an idea that was just one example but if you go in uh, and search you see so many banks right. there were banks that uh, at one point were accepting all the money from the uh, the cartel of drug in Mexico, uh, simple because uh, they don't care where right. the money comes from, and, and 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 this is, for example, another aspect of our country. We are uh, the country with the great banks, but the banks uh, that have uh, more branches in Caribbean, in the Caribbean. And, and in, in offshore countries, so you imagine being uh, criminals and uh, deposit uh, ten, twenty million dollars in uh, a branch of a, of, a, of an offshore country, uh, and use uh, that money as a collateral to borrow money in Toronto, in Vancouver, in Montreal from the same bank. You don't use any more dirty money. You use uh, money from a bank because you can borrow that money with uh, uh, other money, the dirty money that you deposit in the same bank, but in an offshore branch of that bank uh, where nobody uh, cares where the money comes from. Right. The one thing you mentioned right at the beginning was Bitcoin. The yes. dark web and Bitcoin. This is something that I actually, I, I did a lot of research in this, and it was I was shocked by how open and transparent a lot of this underworld appears to be. For example, if you go to Wikipedia, there are a listing of all 86 uh, Indinas, I think they're called, of the Indrangheta. There's, I mean, you can see so much information. It's all written about, it's mythologized, which I think is a very key point here. Um, but one thing that I didn't see anything about, and you're just bringing up now, which I didn't think about, which Bitcoin and the use of cryptocurrencies, um, which is obvious. We know that there's a very strong tie between cryptocurrency and crime. Um, but in your, what have you discovered about this, and, and how is technology playing a role in the evolution of the mafia and organized crime? I, I was, uh, uh, Ben, I was really surprised to learn that uh, the Ndrangheta was using bitcoins. Because uh, a few years ago, I published a book in Italy called The Fiumi d'Oro, uh, Gold the Rivers. And, uh, and I, um, after a long analysis of all the cases involved uh, uh, the Ndrangheta in terms of the money laundering, I saw traditional uh, techniques, but not very innovative techniques mm. of money laundering. But recently there was a major uh, police operation. Um, um, a joint venture by the uh, Europol with the three, four uh, countries, including Italy. And I was able to, 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 to review the transcript of uh, uh, the conversation intercepted during that police uh, investigation. And I was surprised by uh, a, a broker of uh, the Ndrangheta, the Calabrian Mafia, who was willing to buy, to pay with the bitcoins uh, if you like we can pay with the bitcoins and also i was uh, surprised when uh, uh, during a recent uh, uh, trip to vancouver i i i, I saw bankomat uh, with uh, uh, an option to borrow money but at the same time to borrow bitcoins everywhere in 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 in, in, in many restaurants and and that was uh, that was uh, uh, really something that uh, uh, shocked me, uh, surprised me. I, I, I never thought that uh, it was so easy to 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 borrow money fr from a bankomat. But also, I was uh, surprised to see that uh, uh, the Ndrangheta is now moving into this uh, world of uh, uh, cryptocurrency. It's fascinating. I mean, and and to know that obviously criminals are looking for new and innovative ways to launder their money and to, to build these networks of cooperation as well. Um, do you, I mean, are there other, you, you mentioned the dark web, are there other things that they're doing that might not, whether or not it's surprising, but that are innovative and maybe a step ahead of the police or the head of the government? 
Uh, I, I mentioned before the undernet or the darknet, and um, recently uh, two mobsters in uh, in Canada um, were convicted for uh, uh, drug trafficking. One of uh, them, uh, they were two brothers from Hamilton, uh, was used the internet to purchase fentanyl. Yeah. And uh, using fentanyl uh, as a, a source of uh, uh, drug, uh, you can uh, really use that the dark net to, if you have anyone capable to access that uh, that platform. And, and, and you can purchase fentanyl, uh, um, a kilo of fentanyl from China, and they can deliver it direct to your to your home. You pay $10,500 for a kilo of fentanyl, and then you can produce one million tablet and sell each tablet for $20. Uh, when you use internet and darknet, there is no way the police can intercept any kind of a conversation. I remember the time where on the phone they said, send me uh, 20 pyjamas, uh, sent me uh, <laughs> 20 uh, cakes. Uh, uh, yeah. They have to invent any kind of um, lexicon to, 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 to uh, make any deal with, uh, with the Colombians, Peruvians, Bolivians. But uh, with, uh, with, f with uh, the internet, uh, th there is no way that the police can uh, uh, intercept. Uh, 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 and it's a new uh, frontier, a new world that, that it's open to um, criminal organization, new opportunities. And, and, and that uh, will uh, confirm my idea that uh, criminal organizations are modern institutions, a modern um, phenomenon. Uh, be capable to combine tradition and innovation. Uh, you mentioned uh, ritual, the symbols, uh, meat. They were important to, to create a sense of belonging, uh, a sense of identity. But, also, but those, those people are capable to adapt themselves to new situations, mm -hmm. to the new technology, to the globalization, the idea to, to make deals with other criminal organizations. The Ndrangheta, I studied Ndrangheta for more than, for more than four years. And they are in contact with uh, 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 Sendero Luminoso, uh, Shining Path in 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 in, in Peru, uh, with the, s the features, the local criminal organization in Bolivia. They were uh, in touch with the FARC uh, in in Colombia, and now with the Bacrims, uh, uh, Bandas Criminales, uh, with the Autodefensas Gaitanista, who replaced uh, that replace the the FARC. Uh, they were in touch with uh, the paramilitaries uh, uh, such as the Auto Defensas Unidas de Colombia. But if you move uh, uh, southern in Brazil, they have a contact with the Primero Comando da Capital, uh, one of the largest criminal organizations there. They use the Port of Santos to ship containers um, to Europe and to Africa. Africa is a, is a, a new uh, place to, to, to ship containers and then uh, send uh, mm -hmm. cocaine on demand uh, to any port of, uh, of Europe. Uh, really, uh, the globalization uh, opened up a, 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 a new world, a new opportunities mm -hmm. for criminals. One of the wonderful images that Antonio Nicazzo has given us so far is that of H2O, the chemical constitution of water two atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen. Hydrogen, of course, for the Mafia, is the money-making, the criminal activity, the violence, the coercion. But the oxygen is what makes the Mafia the Mafia. It's what makes it tick. It's the connection to the legitimate upper world that Antonio calls it. And what's important about this is that it is our storytelling in this upper world that enables the Mafia and feeds right back into it. It's a really fascinating insight that Antonio has given through his many books and lectures and research that the Mafia operates only in connection to legitimacy and legitimate power. So if that's true, what is our responsibility, not just as storytellers, but as consumers of those stories? 
All that and more is coming up on this episode of What on Earth is Going On. Well, one thing that I read that you wrote was that uh, the Rizzuto family were the ones who foresaw globalization and its effects, and that's part of what they capitalized on and were able to profit from. Um, but you mentioned, uh, again, the, the idea of identity, these myths and rituals and symbols that create belonging and community and identity amongst, whether it's the Cosa Nostra or the crime family in Toronto or w- wherever you're looking. There's a certain culture that comes with this that is distinguishable from other criminal cultures, but also distinguishable from any other culture, which I find really interesting. And one of the obvious things, there, there's two points that, that I came to in this particular branch of discussion. One thing is obvious and one thing is not so obvious. The obvious thing is, is that when we have movies like The Godfather, Goodfellas, even Bad Blood on Netflix, um, all you know, this whole pop culture um, category of the mobster film, the mafia film, where we see these honorable men do dishonorable things. And there's, there are tropes with it, whether it's the leather jackets, the way you dress and all this stuff. The obvious thing is, is that it, you know, it's, it's almost making crime look okay or, or heroizing it or, or mythologizing it. And that's the obvious thing. The thing that was not so obvious to me is that this pop culture has actually fed back in to the mafia. So you, one thing you said was that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, there was no dress code in the mafia. There was no dress code in Calabria or Sicily or New York and Montreal. There was nothing like that. And now there is. And the dress code is eerily similar to the dress code that you see in The Sopranos, for example, that this pop culture has actually fed back into the mafia and they get their cues from that. One thing, I, I forget who it was, but they were arrested in, um, in I think, 2010, Um, And amongst their personal effects was a signed photograph of The Sopranos with James Gandolfini's signature on it. And this is a a pride of possession for this this mobster. Um, And so it seems to me that it's not only a story that is uniting um, what it means to be in the mafia, but it's also, it's creating a, a general wider culture of acceptance with it, that maybe the underworld is just a part of the way things are. And maybe if it's 4% 4% of our GDP, that's too much, but 3.5%, we can manage as long as you keep the bloodshed off the streets. Maybe you can kill each other, but do it behind closed doors and make sure you chop up the bodies and put it somewhere we don't find them. Um, I mean, <laughs> I, know, I, I know that this is a lot of what you talk about is this sense of identity and story, but do you think that we're at risk of telling these stories and enabling organized crime too much with fiction and with true crime, with Netflix shows and The Godfather, do you think that we're almost doing, doing them a service with all of this? That was my, always my, my concern, Ben. Uh, uh, I discovered that uh, in uh, 1993, after I published a, a book called The Deadly Silence. A few months later, uh, Narsim P., uh, sergeant called me and said that uh, oh uh, you should listen to this conversation there were two mobs uh, talking about me and one uh, was uh, screaming uh, we should kill them we should kill them and the other guy said why because he misspelled my last name <laughs> and, uh, and and I and I learned a lot from uh, that episode and and you're absolutely right uh, um, historically uh, Prohibition glamorize organized crime. Uh, if you uh, remember movies like uh, The Little Caesar, uh, Scarface, uh, uh, that is based loosely inspired or based on the uh, on on the the life of uh, Al Capone. Uh, that was uh, the beginning of a strange mechanism where uh, uh, life uh, uh, mirrors uh, uh, art uh, yeah. and vice versa. They start to uh, copy one another. They were watching those people on, on the big screen and they start to dress like them. And, and, uh, and th- there is a, a, a big issue with the way uh, we uh, describe and tell the story. Uh, and, and that's why it's always a risk. I remember when uh, uh, 
the Godfather uh, was just an idea, and uh, uh, Joe Colombo, one uh, the boss of the, one of the five families, uh, started to send a message to the executive of Paramount, uh, forcing them to sit down. Actually, he organized a rally, um, involved the thousands and thousands of people to demonstrate against that movie to stop the production and at the end they were able to reach an agreement uh, the, the, to avoid the, to use the word mafia or cosa nostra to, to hire some people from uh, their organization Luca Brasi was a member of uh, uh, one of the five family uh, and, and, and many other many other things uh, but when the they watched the Godfather on the big screen. They love it because <laughs> they confirmed the idea of this um, mytho mythology about the old mafia. I I historically, there was not an old mafia and a new mafia. Mafia was always bad. Mm -hmm. But the idea that the guy, Vito Corleone, was forced to enter into the mafia to revenge his, uh, his, uh, his father uh, the same like michael the entered son, yeah. into the into the family the idea that the free will and necessity uh, the idea that you cannot um, go on your way when there is the necessity to do something for the family and 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 and, uh, and, and they love it this idea of a, of a boss who was against uh, narcotics uh, uh, like Virgilio Solozzo who was uh, uh, involved in, 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 in this new business uh, historically if you go and looking uh, uh, in the United States all families were involved in narcotics and since the, nine, the, the 1920s mm. and, and, and the few people that said no I don't want to deal with uh, drugs they were benefited by the profit uh, they made uh, through the renting of the territory. You can use my territory to sell narcotics, pay me a percentage right. of the profit. So the idea that the people could watch Vito Colleone and said, oh, I'm like him, I'm not like Virgilio Solot, so give them a new opportunity to reinforce this uh, false idea of uh, a man of honor, a man of family, a man of tradition, and, and that helped a lot. It's a masterpiece, but uh, provide a great service to the self-representation of mobsters. Well, it's, it's propaganda in a way that never intended to be propaganda. I'm sure Francis Ford Coppola never intended when he created The Godfather in 72 to enable organized crime, nor did anybody who worked on that film, um, even if that has been the effect of it. Um, and so, I mean, this, this calls into a question, maybe a, a larger philosophical question, which I just want to toss out there, which is, I mean, what role does art serve in our society? What role does storytelling serve in our society? And is there a point at which storytelling is, is um, against the common good? For example, um, all of this stuff that we're talking about that seems to enable a culture and uh, enable us to accept a culture of crime, which any reasonable person would say is not a good thing. Um, I mean, is there a point at which art is actually problematic and, and ne not, I don't want to talk about censorship, but maybe just the common good of, of art and, and storytelling. But the essence of storytelling, it's confabulation. So, and, uh, and, and that's, it's, um, I think, uh, what uh, we should keep in mind when, uh, we try to describe them. We try to represent them. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I, I don't like to 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 criticize any uh, representation. And I want to. But I want to be the guy who said, "Oh, this is good right. and this is bad." Yeah. No, but I think uh, we should be a little bit more conscious when we describe them. To describe them uh, not just uh, as a hero, people that uh, you can uh, enter in empathy with. Uh, how can you avoid to enter in empathy with Vito Corleone? Since the beginning, since the opening scene, uh, he's provided an alternative sense of justice. And he's not a murderer. 
he assign the task to punish the two uh, young men uh, uh, um, who try to rape the, the daughter of uh, Signor Bonasera, uh, he, he send Clemenza, and Clemenza uh, in Italian means Clemens. So the idea that he is just, he's a, he's a fair man. So uh, I think we should tell the story, but uh, to, to 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 make the same to look uh, for the way they are. For example, mm -hmm. if you watch uh, Narcos and you see Pablo Escobar, many people said, oh, he was a great guy. He gave many things uh, to the poor. He helped the poor and everything. But the m many people underestimated that, that uh, he was a pedophile almost <laughs> because he married the, his wife when she was 13. And, 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 and in during his life, many people were brought... Uh, teenagers uh, to, to, to to him because he love uh, uh, teenagers and, and, and that's uh, what uh, we should keep in mind mm -hmm. because uh, the worst things that we can do is to uh, reproduce the uh, Robin Hood effect uh, I think uh, the, the, the legend of Robin Hood is a perfect example uh, we uh, through that example, we can justify crime. Uh, yes, he um, uh, stole from the rich to give to the poor, but he was a, 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 a criminal. So he made a mm -hmm. crime, committed a crime, but we justify the crime. And that's what criminals continue to do, try to justify the crime. That's why, for example, if you are able to invent a code, the code of honor or whatever, the silence, the omerta, uh, you can convert and transform a murderer in a, a guy that uh, was forced to kill someone because uh, the victim betrayed the code. Right. So he won't perceive himself as a murderer. So crime stopped to be a murder, stopped to be a crime and become a punishment. And when you are able to build this uh, ideological construct in the mind of a people, uh, you are uh, on the perfect track to build uh, a criminal organization that uh, being perceived not just a bunch of violent people. Right. This is the code. I was forced to kill that guy because he betrayed the code. Well, and also, it's not just it's not just violence and crime. I mean, as you've said, this is an alternative justice system, an alternative sense of morality. I mean, how could I not empathize, for example, with Michael Corleone in The Godfather, who grew up in this family, didn't want to do it, but then felt forced into it to defend his family. And, if, and it's very conceivable in the story that if he chose not to become the next Godfather, that his family would have been completely wiped out. Very conceivable. So what's the right choice to make in Michael's shoes? And of course, his whole journey in all three films, whatever you want to say about the third one, is one of, of this, this tension between being the, doing the right thing and, and, and becoming a member of a larger, more legitimate society. It's impossible not to empathize with that. But I think the question, the philosophical question is, is the one that the Greeks proposed 2,500 years ago, which is, for example, what Plato asked. What is the role of the poet, of the artist in our society? And poetry and art can be dangerously deceptive because it, it prevents us from seeing things the way that they actually are. And the way that organized crime actually is, is a network of trust. There is benefit to both sides. I probably have benefited in some small way to the mafia making sure that a murder didn't have, wasn't committed in front of me on a street one day. I mean, who knows? This is a counterfactual, but there's a certain stability and justice, whether it's alternative or not, on the other side. But I think what you've done a lot of your work to do, which is to demystify all of this and say, see it for how it really is. So really you're performing the opposite function of deception, um, which almost enables us to look at this stuff and enjoy it for the art that it is as opposed to the, the reality that we wish it would be. Um, yeah. No, I, I, I totally agree. I don't know what the other people can do, but uh, I know definitely what the I want to do and, uh, and, and, and it's to continue to the banking, uh, the meat uh, of, uh, of uh, the mafia or the men of honor. Uh, 
you mentioned many times uh, bad blood. At one point, there is a confrontation between Vito Rizzuto and uh, Declan Gardner. And, 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 and Vito was very upset because uh, he lost uh, his son, uh, his, his father, the brother-in-law, uh, so many members of the family. And they said, they killed my son. And, and Declan Gardner replied, everybody we have killed was somebody's son, Vito. And so those few lines put everything under a different light because uh, it's easy when you have to kill the uh, other people uh, but when you uh, suffer the pain uh, you think that the, your pain is different than other it's better it's larger right. it's uh, 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 and, and that's what the I think uh, uh, we should continue to do uh, to put everything in perspective to 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 make people to realize what the mafia is all about because uh, we trend to remon uh, uh, romanticize the mafia because we use uh, this uh, psychological distance oh uh, I don't have nothing to do with them they don't uh, affect my life uh, I don't buy narcotics I don't uh, go in a, a nightclub but I don't go with prostitutes, uh, so uh, who cares about them? So I can romanticize, I can watch them on on, on TV, or, and, and I can enjoy. Uh, but uh, when you make people to understand that, that uh, those criminals were taking 2.5% on any public works, and they were building a bridge that are falling apart, uh, you see that uh, uh, organized crime uh, uh, affect the life of everyone because mm. they were using taxpayer money in, in, in Quebec. And, 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 and many people said, oh, but that's a problem with Quebec because uh, the, oh, the corruption. I don't think Quebec is a distinct society for corruption or for crime mm -hmm. because corruption and crime does not stop at the border. The problem is Quebec had the uh, political will at one point uh, to investigate, uh, to try to uh, learn, to use our, our anti-gang legislation. They were the only one in Canada. Uh, in many other uh, provinces of, 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 uh, of Canada, we never use it. We always uh, uh, try to bargain down sentence to avoid the cost of a long trial. And, and for that reason, uh, when we blame uh, people in Quebec, uh, the same way we blame the people in Sicily, uh, we have to remember that uh, Sicily uh, it, it, it was the region who founded the mafia, but also Sicily was the region that founded the the anti-mafia, the people uh, uh, who lost their life uh, to fight against the mafia, people who really fought the mafia, the same way people in Quebec decide to challenge the mafia, to do investigation, mm -hmm. to, to fight uh, criminal organizations. I don't think there is a political will in our country to, to, fight, uh, to fight organized crime. Organized crime is not a priority in our country. So, I mean, there's, there's several times that you've mentioned this now, which is the work that you do is, by definition, dangerous. You just mentioned people who fought against the mafia in Sicily. Um, you mentioned the story where someone talked about wanting to kill you because you misspelled their name. Um, but I think it goes deeper than that. I mean, you're someone who is very clear in, in what you think organized crime in the mafia is. Um, you, you, I think that you hope that Canadians had a better understanding of it so that they could enact, say, better policies or vote for people who would make changes that would prevent the work of organized crime. I mean, th to me, that would, I guess, put you in the crosshairs of some people out there who would have no trouble resorting to violence. Um, and I, I, I hope this isn't a cliched question uh, or a naive question, but I mean, very simply... Uh, do you sometimes feel that you're doing dangerous work and how do you how do you deal with that well i i i like to think uh, about me like a person who have the courage of fear because there is no courage without fear if i would have answered by saying up uh, I, I don't have any fear i don't have any problem i um, I'm perfectly fine. Um, I would underestimate the, 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 the strain of a threat. And I received so many threats in my life. So I never underestimated the threat. 
But I have uh, this uh, idea that uh, uh, I want to do uh, with the passion, with courage, what I'm, uh, what I uh, did for all my life. I tried to raise uh, concern about organized crime. It's a, it's a, it's a, a safe uh, um, way of uh, of dealing uh, with the social issue. Maybe not. Uh, many people um, don't like me and express it that uh, sentiment uh, uh, through people, uh, through common friends, uh, to people that approach me and said, oh, I witnessed a, a conversation where they were talking uh, uh, about you. And uh, But I, I think I, I, I made a choice. I, I always remember uh, the first time uh, I learned and I heard the word the mafia I was six and a half. The mafia killed the father of a schoolmate. And I think that, that in that moment, uh, I, I realized that the, uh, there was a two way of dealing with the problem. In defense, uh, I don't care, uh, uh, or knowledge. Uh, okay. I was six and a half. Uh, I don't know what happened that day. But I, I start the two uh, cats, uh, newspaper clips, uh, putting in, in this big block notes, uh, pay attention of organized crime. Uh, the same way many other uh, schoolmates were pay attention to um, the soccer players. And, uh, and I build a, a conscience, a awareness, a, the idea that I had to do something one day. Um, because uh, what I remember was uh, the pain in the eyes of my schoolmates when he lost his father. He was killed because he refused to buy uh, construction materials from uh, the boss who controlled the area. And I think that uh, was a, a, a turning point uh, uh, in my life. Uh, the idea that uh, uh, there were enemies, there were bad people out there. And, uh, and I think uh, um, the idea of uh, knowledge is what uh, uh, we can do uh, in the fight against uh, organized crime. Uh, we don't have a gun. Uh, our guns are the words that we use to write books or to answer interview, uh, or to raise uh, uh, awareness, uh, and, 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 and that's it's the only things that we can do. But I think we do have a responsibility. We cannot say, this is something that does not affect them. Who cares? I don't care. Uh, uh, I think we should do something. And, uh, and I, what I really want to do is to uh, make people aware of what organized crime is all about. That's why I'm very happy when I see uh, the auditorium full of students. Uh, I, I, I teach two courses at Queen's, uh, 600 students, uh, and, and at the end of the course, to having people said, I want to pursue this mm -hmm. career, I want to do a master on this, I want to do this, I want to do that. You inspire me to do something more. And that's it what uh, uh, make me uh, proud. The idea that uh, uh, out there, there are people that uh, want to uh, continue this uh, fight, this, uh, this legacy. Uh, and, I, and, and I'm very happy that uh, uh, I'm still in touch with so many students that I had at Queens that they start to follow the course just for curiosity. And now they are doing master, uh, dealing with the prisons, uh, dealing with the youth gangs, uh, dealing mm -hmm. with the money laundering uh, and, and many other issues. I think uh, that's uh, it's a big accomplishment and that's what I uh, that, that, that's the, what uh, fuel uh, my, my, my enthusiasm and my passion the idea that the, you can uh, uh, work with, uh, with students uh, raise uh, concern and make them uh, to understand that uh, the mafia romanticized by the godfather is good to watch but it's not uh, mm -hmm. the real one that's a, a really wonderful answer to take 
fear into inspiration to take your own personal sacrifices and danger, but of course the one that you experienced when you were six and a half and turn it into something that's quite inspiring. And I think that that changes the world. Um, so my last question for you uh, is always the same for everybody, which is um, if you could ask someone, uh, maybe on the same vein as what we've been talking about, what on earth is going on? Uh, they could be alive or dead. They could be within the field. They could be beyond the field. They could be a completely different person. Who would you ask that question to and why? But I think uh, I would love to sit down with the, uh, the Prime Minister, the Solicitor General. I did that in the past with many other people and, and, and ask them why we underestimated the threats of, of organized mm. crime. Why don't do something? Why do don't put political will in the fight of organized crime. Why? Every time we have to choose between the national security and a fight of organized crime, uh, we move all the resources uh, in uh, the fight against uh, national security uh, instead of understanding that uh, they are both uh, major threats and then we have to deal equally with the both of them uh, instead of uh, drop cases uh, because we don't have enough uh, mm -hmm. uh, resources. Uh, I, I, because I think uh, uh, more than uh, resources, uh, it's important to understand uh, that we should uh, uh, reform our legislation in dealing with the money laundering to, to make this country a little bit more uh, uh, problematic in terms of uh, money laundering for criminals. Now it's very easy for them, and this is why they love Canada. Uh, every major criminal organization has a branch in this country. And I, if, I, if, I, if I would ask why uh, they love uh, this country, I think that would be the first question uh, to start to mm. make uh, changes and to understand that, that the fight against organized crime should be a priority in Canada. One quick question. If there was one thing that, say, the Canadian government could do right now uh, to, to help solve this problem, what would it be? First of all, uh, to read the report by Transnational International, uh, they blame Canada because we are so lack in the fight against the money laundering, because we allow the lawyers and uh, public notary in Quebec to uh, avoid uh, due diligence and to not uh, uh, report a suspicious transaction. I think uh, they should uh, uh, understand uh, uh, why many people uh, are considered um, Canada a perfect laundromat and why we are not uh, reacting in a proper way uh, when uh, uh, um, there is an issue uh, that w is an uh, international uh, expose uh, and 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 I think uh, that's uh, is something that uh, we should do uh, without uh, uh, procrastinating the, the idea of uh, uh, sit down around the table and said what we can do uh, to change uh, and to make uh, Canada a better place. Mm -hmm. Antonio, this has been a, a really fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ben. To learn more about Antonio Nicazzo and his work on the Mafia, go to the website, wogopodcast.com. That's W-O-E-G-O podcast.com. And there you can find links to social media so that you can get in touch and also all previous episodes. Now, before we get to the quote of the week, I wanted to give a shout out for this excellent music that you're hearing. It's from Andrea Wettstein of Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and her company, Six Degrees Sound and Music. For more information about them, go to sixdegrees.ca. That's S-I-X degrees dot C-A. I'm immensely proud of the work that they've done. Really, really happy to have music for the first time on this show. And as you can see, it's just great stuff. So anyways, your quote of the week is from George Bernard Shaw. And it's often seen as a critique of capitalism, but you can also apply it to the connection between the underworld and the upper world of the mafia. It goes, the faults of the burglar are the qualities of the financier. 
Next week, we're speaking with Jen Stevenson about how theater and the arts can represent objective truth. Thanks for listening.